I am absolutely delighted to be here, especially with, with these folks who I've gotten to know over the last few months. And I've heard them play a number of times. In fact, I, I produced a concert at Kenny Bunk that uh, um, Seamus talked about hearing them. And it's been a, it's been a great association so far. I by no means claim to be any kind of expert on, on Franco-American fiddling or French Canadian culture in New England. Um, but I like it, you know, hey, that's good enough, right? Um, and, and we thought that, that, you know, since this is Irish, Irish stuff, Gaelic roots, and most of the things that Seamus presents here are Irish music and musicians, we thought it might be beneficial to give a little bit of, of you know, short, you know, 10, 15 minute little presentation at the beginning, and slideshow, and, and let Don and Cindy talk about themselves and their family and their music, just to give you a little bit of context for where they're coming from. Some of you may very well be, you know, wondering why the heck we're doing this, because you are very familiar with the presence of, you know, a lot of French, um, French Canadians in, um, in, in New England and about Franco-American culture, but some of the rest of you may not, so we thought it would be a little useful for this. And I'm going to ask my lovely assistant over there to give a video talking. Okay, get it um, There are a lot of people of French Canadian ancestry, heritage here in New England. Why are they here? Well, they came down mostly from Quebec. And this is putting aside any of the original pre-colonial French settlers who were here. But starting in the mid-19th century, or somewhere around 1840, there started to be a lot of emigration down here from Quebec, mostly rural Quebec. And why did people come? Why did people usually emigrate? For economic reasons. There were hard times in rural Quebec and America. The uh, Industrial Revolution was kicking into gear. There was a great rise of manufacturing and industrialization in New England. Um, and there was a great need for, for labor, for, for um, you know, cheap labor to work in the mills. Um, the U.S. Civil War had a lot to do with this as well. Um, about 40,000 French Canadians were, were drafted to serve in the Union Army. And others came here to work in the mills because all the New England farm boys were off shooting at their, their southern cousins in the war. And the war per, had to, you know, produced a great need for manufacturing, manufacturing goods. So everything kind of worked together there. And the, uh, <clears throat> the estimate is that between 1840 and 1930, um, perhaps a million people came down from, mostly from Quebec, but not exclusively, as we'll be talking about in a bit. Um, the peak of that was probably in the 1870s, 1930 you know, era. Yeah. So many of them came down to work in mills, um, textile mills, or paper mills, or various other sorts of things. Lewiston, Maine had a huge French Canadian population. A lot of towns in Massachusetts, the, the Lowell and the Lawrence factories and Haverhill were all you know, heavily populated by French Canadian folks. Um, in New Hampshire, uh, uh, you know, uh, Exeter, I think, I mean, maybe not Exeter, but uh, a lot of little mill towns around. Um, Dover, I think, had a good, good, good sized population. Pardon? Manchester, yes, thank you. The biggest city in the state. How could I forget that? And Maine, of course, Lewiston um, had, had many. Sanford had, had a large French Canadian population. We live in Kennebunk, just north of that. Saco and Biddeford, there's big mills on either side of the river there, and, and those were largely staffed by folks who come down from Canada. The S.D. Warren paper mill over here in Westbrook, Maine, Cindy can tell you about that. My grandfather worked in this mill. My grandfather, who was my musical influence, he worked in the mill, my dad worked in the mill, my uncles worked in the mill, Don's cousin worked in the mill, everybody worked in the mill. My father always said, if you don't smell that smell, it means daddy's not making money. So if you smell <laughs> that raunchy smell, that means daddy's making money and there'll be supper on the table. So don't complain about the smell. <laughs> Cindy's family actually came down from Prince Edward Island, French family, but they came down from the Maritimes. Don's folks came down to her grandfather. You'll meet him in momentarily it came down from Quebec. Right? Yeah, from the post region of Quebec. Yeah. And uh, my other side came from the gas bay. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. And they worked in uh, paper mills? Scott. Scott paper in uh, Winslow. In Winslow. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. People who came down for other reasons, um, the lumber industry. They had a huge lumber industry in the 19th century. And a lot of other folks came down to work in the lumber camps. And we'll be meeting a little bit more, a little bit later, we'll be meeting one of them, um, Simon St. Pierre, a good little player. And, you know, both in the, in the mill towns, uh, what I neglected to mention was that in the, the towns where the mills were, French Canadian communities grew up. Um, little Canada, as they were usually called. And we can only imagine what, what sorts of music and, and song and, and you know, fiddling and singing and whatnot went on um, after hours, you said, on, on Sundays often. 
After church, After there was church. Uh, there was always uh, something going on. They'd stop over for nku, nziku, <laughs> and uh, after mass. And uh, sometimes they would stay through dinner, um, and all the other relatives would come, the aunts and uncles, the cousins. Um, they'd just keep adding potatoes to the pot as <laughs> people kept coming in. And, uh, and then there'd be card games and music, and yeah, so it was pretty common. Yeah. And in the lumber camps, um, Simon St. Pierre was uh, talking about them to, to an interviewer a few years ago. He said that every bunkhouse had at least one good fiddler, at least one good fiddler, with a large repertoire of tunes. So you can imagine these guys getting together when it's you know after hours or whatnot. Not no television, nothing else to do. So what are you going to do? You're going to sing and play fiddle and learn tunes. Good deal. Yeah, good sound. Now let's meet a few of the, the known French Canadian fillers. Um, mm -hmm. This one, this list, young lady really intrigues me. This is a photo from, from my personal collection. Um, not only is it one of, probably one of the very earliest uh, photographs we have of a Franco-American fiddler in New England, but um, a young woman, um, which I think is pretty unusual in those days. It says in the bottom, very nicely, someone wrote in, Emma Robichaux, age 13. Um, I published this with an article in a magazine a, a few months back, and someone who was very adept at using Ancestry.com and doing genealogical searches jumped on this and found who we think was, was young Emma. We're not entirely sure if it was the right one. Um, she was probably born in 1881, which makes the photo about um, 1894, 1895, if she was 13 years old at the time. The photo was taken from at a studio in Greenville, New Hampshire, which is a little west of Nashua, just north of the Mass Line. But she apparently lived in Belmont, which is further north, above, um, above Concord and up near Laconia. And from all we know, she worked in the mills, big surprise, all her life, and never married, which is probably why she got to be a fiddle player, right? <laughs> Maybe that's why she never married, because she was a fiddle player. Yeah, well. you know. Anyway. Young Emma Robichaux was a name that's well known in New England um, Franco-American um, filling circles, and we'll meet Jerry Robichaux in a bit. Gets out. These fellas, um, another one of my photos, they're from Lewiston. They're unidentified. Um, I'm just guessing and hoping that they probably were French. Um, you know, that at the at the beginning, this is around the turn of the century. Um, the studio was run by a French person. Lewiston had a huge um, Franco-American population at the time. So I think the odds are pretty good. Um, this summer, a colleague of mine at the uh, um, Portland Public Library and I put up a, a, an exhibit of, new, of Maine fiddling. And we put these fellows in there, and they kind of became our poster boy. we, we well, boys, we became very fond of them. And we dubbed them um, Isidore and Henri, but you know, <laughs> we don't know. They could have been, you know, Bill and Charlie for a long time. But we like to think they were French. We'll, we'll make them French, OK? Yeah. Now some known quantities. You know, the folks we've seen so far were, you know, but, just average folks. Um, Joseph Allard, who was one of the greatest of the early um, Quebec fiddlers to record, probably was born in Woodland, Maine. There are conflicting, there's conflicting information about this. Some people say that he was born in, in, um, um, in Chateau Gay, um, province of Quebec, which is right <coughs> Montreal. But other sources say he was born in Woodland, Maine, moved to Montreal as a young man, came back to Maine you know, when he was in his teens, and then I guess went back to Montreal, but is, is said to have played a lot around in Massachusetts and other places in New England. He took part in a big fiddle contest in Lewiston in 1926, a big international contest. In, 19, he, in about 1928, he began making commercial recordings, mostly for the Victor label, and he later became a mentor to the great Jean Perignon, who I hope some of you know was a marvelous, marvelous you know, technician and just great fiddle player. But, uh, in fact, Jean Curignan recorded an LP called Homage à Joseph Allard, where he played a lot of tunes from the repertoire. So, another fellow who's known quantity, uh, J.O. La Madeleine. We don't know that he had any, uh, that he ever lived in New England. Um, again, he made a lot of records. Um, born in 1880 and died in, in, in Montreal. Um, but I, I think he probably had a Massachusetts association because he recorded these tunes, okay, so, with referencing a couple of towns out in the Connecticut Valley of Massachusetts, Springfield and Holyoke. Holyoke had a huge, and still does have a big French Canadian population. Um, Springfield is, is right just south of Holyoke, out, out in my part of the world. Um, both of these tunes are, I, I don't think he wrote them. Um, 
they were older tunes. I've heard other recordings of the tunes under different titles. So my, my guess here is that he was taking tunes that he knew, and for reasons either he had family in these places, or played there, or maybe lived there himself for a time, um, gave them these names as some sort of you know honorary you know, tribute to, to these towns. Oh, we're stealing them. And we're stealing them. <laughs> there was so much money to be made in this stuff. Yeah, yeah. Like now, right? Yeah. And he also recorded a New Bedford reel, too. So I like to think that he probably had some um, Massachusetts connections. And here's Simon St. Pierre, who I mentioned earlier, who came down not to work in the mills, and came down not in the 19th century, but in the 1950s. He was a lumberman, a sawmill operator. He came down here, again, because he thought the opportunities were better in, in the schools <coughs> than they had been in Quebec. Um, Simon is a very good fiddle player. I've never had the pleasure of hearing him in person. Have, have you? Oh, yeah, him? many times, yeah. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, one time we had a fiddle contest, and we everybody that won gave him the money because his house had just burned. Oh, yeah. Oh, dear. Yeah. yeah. But he, uh, he was honored with a National Heritage Fellowship uh, from the National Endowment for the Arts way back in 1983. And as you know, Seamus received one of those um, just last year. Um, so I'm going to record a number of albums in the, in the 70s, some with bluegrass backing, which is a little strange, but it's, it's good. Sam Tidwell. And yeah, yeah, yeah. And he looks like he plays with his fiddle down in his chest, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Jay? Sally? Here's a fellow that was one of the first traditional musicians I ever got to know, and certainly one of the first French Canadian fiddlers, a fellow named Louis Bablin, who was a marvelous old style Quebec fiddler, um, a very nice fellow. His family came down from Quebec, his, his, his father, I think, was born in Quebec, moved down to Lowell, to Lowell around 1908, and then he went to work in the mills, and then he eventually moved back to Burlington, Vermont, because they thought at that time the opportunities were better. Louis was a great fiddle player, he made a couple of records. Um, he, he involved his family as well in his music. Um, his wife was a, was a fine singer of, of old traditional French Canadian songs. And at least two of his five, four daughters played piano with him. One was a very fine step dancer, mm -hmm. Lisa, probably still is. I'm afraid that I've, I've lost touch with the family in recent years. Louis himself passed away in 1980. A great loss, he was a wonderful musician. At least he's on Facebook. Is she? Yeah. No I'm kidding. Yeah. Oh, all right. You can find anybody on Facebook. Yeah. And now, and now we get to be a little bit more local here. Um, we had Emma Rubber show before, who was probably in a relation to Jerry, because Jerry was from New Brunswick, not from, from Quebec. He didn't, like Simon St. Pierre, he didn't come down here um, to the States until 1957, I believe it was, 1955. And he was lived in Waltham, right next door, practically. He came through Waltham, came down here from Maine today. Jerry was, again, a wonderful fiddle player, nice fellow. I never knew him all that well. Uh, played at the French Club in Waltham, or for Saturday night dances, alternating with Joe Cormier for 500 years. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. And big, big influence, big friend of Don and Also played with the main French fiddlers for a year or yeah. two. Yeah. And we'll see them in just a moment. <laughs> but Jerry did a few albums, and, and this was, I think, his last one he did with his brother, which is, really gets into the old time um, Acadian repertoire very nicely. And unfortunately, Jerry, Jerry left us a little over a year or a year and a half ago. Um, okay, now we're going to get into the music a little bit. <clears throat> we talked about people coming down, you know, starting the 19th century, but there must have been some kind of exchange going on either that, that early or maybe before that time. I'm going to ask Don to play. This is two versions of the same tune, they're just in different keys. And uh, both come from Boston publications in the mid 19th century, well, 1844, a little bit earlier than that, and then mid 19th century. And Don's going to play a little bit of, of yeah. for the first time. Yeah. Okay, and we'll go to Sally next slide. It's now a French Canadian tune called La Bas Frank. <laughs> This is a London publication from about 1825. Same tune, 
And here it's titled, Voulez-vous danser? And interestingly enough, the words to La Bastrain, which Cindy will now sing for us. Um, a few of the a words. Few words yeah. Mademoiselle, voulez-vous danser? La Bastrain, la Bastrain, Mademoiselle, voulez-vous danser? La Bastrain, come on, say. That's all I know, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Very famous recording of that by a woman named uh, Madame Bolte, mm -hmm. who was, a, I guess, a Montreal singer, um, very popular in the 1970s and 30s and, and on, who sang uh, a lot of the traditional French Canadian songs, many of which the melodies were the same as the fiddlers were playing, like this one. But this was maybe the first French Canadian tune I ever, I ever tried to play. So, um, moving on, there's even more exchange. Um, this is a very interesting tune from a very interesting manuscript that comes from Maine, um, up in the Sumner and Canton area, um, written down in 1854, the copied over again in 1904. This manuscript is owned by the archive that I used to direct in Tennessee, but this comes from Maine. And a few months back when we were working on this exhibit, I sat down with Frank Farrell, who some of you may know, was a very fine fellow, who lives in, lived around here for a long time, lives in Bath, Maine now. He played through that, we were going through some of the tunes in this little book, Way through that, said, man, that's familiar. That sounds awful. Yeah. And it rattled around in Frank's head for a couple of days, and he emailed me and said, Oh, that's part of Le Rossignol. And this is uh, a tune that I associate with Jean Carignan, and it happens to be one that Don and Cindy play. And this happens to come from Don's own tune book. There you go. Yeah, Le Rossignol. I, I suspect he's probably going to play it later on in the, in the program. I am now. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like to put my friends on the spot too much. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's get to the specifics here. Um, talk about Donna and Cindy and their families. Um, on the left, you have Joe Matthew, and on the right, Lucian Matthew. And Don, tell us who they were. Well, this, Joe was my grandfather. Came down, worked at Scott Paper, and uh, unfortunately, I never got to hear him play. He cut his first finger off at the mill. And so all the music of his I learned through my Uncle Lucian. And, uh, but my grandfather was my biggest fan. He'd sit for hours and just listen to me play. I'd go, just he and I in the kitchen, and yeah, great. he'd have a little whiskey to yeah. go along with that. <laughs> of course. Yeah, yeah. He, he loved it. And uh, but my Uncle Lucian really is the one that got me going. He taught me you know, how to play all by ear. And, and we traveled around a lot to fiddle contests and met a lot of people and had a lot of great times. And, and uh, yeah, so. And Lucian passed away when? Not about four years ago. Maybe three years. Three years? Yeah. yeah. I sort of remember him from fiddle contests in the 1970s. <coughs> yeah. A lot of fun. Yeah. And the next slide is get to Cindy's family. Her uncle, Clifford, over there, is a young fella in the fiddle. <laughs> and her grandfather. Um, that fiddle. Don still owns that fiddle, and we had that in the, the exhibit. That, we, that one. That one, that one over there. In the, in the exhibit that we had in, in, in Portland, I should mention that Don is a fiddle maker. In addition to being a very fine player, he's playing a fiddle tonight that he made, and he's gonna have, you're going to have to check Seamus' pockets when I leave to make sure he doesn't walk off. <laughs> okay. So, Sorry, Cindy, I had it. you got it. <laughs> yeah, I'll make another one. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about, about these folks, Cindy, and their well, music. Um, my grandfather, Alfie Martin, uh, emigrated to the United States um, from Prince Edward Island. Both he and my grandmother, his wife, came from the same town in northwestern Prince Edward Island uh, called Tignish. And they, um, they kind of, they, they were, first they were married in Lowell or Lawrence, Massachusetts, I'm not sure which one, but they both worked in the mills there. And then from there, moved to Rumford, Maine, with the paper mills, and then ended up in Westbrook, Maine, and raised a family there. My Pepe um, played the fiddle, also played the piano. He played all by ear. Um, and actually, then they had, he and my grandmother had six children. And the oldest boy, Clifford, my Uncle Cliff, um, is, he played the fiddle when he was little, but then went more to guitar, and they sang lots of, like, you know, up the lazy river by the old mill stream, those kind of things. So they really, he didn't really continue with the tradition, uh, but my grandfather certainly did. And whenever my uncle was around, there was always a party with him playing back up with my grandfather playing the fiddle. And the oldest daughter, Olive, who lives in California, plays the uh, piano. And she used to play with him at wedding receptions and, and shows, minstrel shows that used to come through Westbrook. My grandfather would always be involved with that. And um, so anyway, that's. 
that's how I got my talent. So, so your grandfather got, um, he had Prince Edward Island repertoire? Um, yes, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, a little bit of Scottish kind yeah. of mixed yeah. in. Big Don Messer fan. Yes. Big Don Messer fan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. There was, and there was always a party at his house. Uh, right. we, I lived with my grandparents. My mom and dad and I lived with them um, from the time I was one until the time I was five when my parents saved money to build the house that we lived in. And um, was there was in Westbrook, in Westbrook. Mm -hmm. and there was always, 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 always on Saturday night a party um, with fiddling friends. And Don's uncle Lucian was also my grandfather's very best friend, and um, Uncle Lucian was always there um, with his wife Marie and lots of other fiddling friends. And they would come. My grandfather would like come across fiddlers, and he'd kind of like hear them a little bit, and then he'd invite them to the house, and it would be kind of like a a trial to see if they were accepted or not. And then if they played really good, then they were accepted into the circle of fiddlers. But yeah. really, he wasn't that selective, but it, it just kind of seemed like that. But, um, but there was always a party. And was he a French speaker? Um, they spoke French to each other. They didn't speak French. Uh, the children understood French, but they didn't speak it um, because there was a stigma against French people in Maine um, during the emigration. They were always given menial jobs. Um, because they didn't understand English, and so they were looked upon as being very stupid. And so I think when the when the people came and emigrated to the states, they didn't want their children to have that same stigma. So they really encouraged them to learn English. And so a lot of times, maybe French was spoken in the house, but they encouraged their children not to speak it. Outside. I know all the swear words. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I heard them enough. So therefore, we never learned how to speak French. But my parents understood French, although they didn't speak it to each other. So that, that story of sort of hiding your culture is something that probably a lot of Irish Americans can relate to as well. Yeah. You know, Scottish it wasn't, mm -hmm. yeah. so it wasn't the language barrier there, pardon? I'm sorry. Scots too. Scots yeah. too. Yeah. 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 So, you know, our country has a great tradition of, of you know, looking down on immigrants, but whatever. No, the fiddle right. pulls them together. The fiddle pulls them together. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Don. OK, so, OK, then, then you know. <laughs> Pick up the fiddle and learning from friends and neighbors. And mm -hmm. Bill Dara, was, tell us about Bill a little bit now. <coughs> Bill ran crane for the railroad and running track up through Crawford Notch. And he used to tell the story of they lived in huts with dirt floors, you know, makeshift camps. And after dinner, he'd get his fiddle out, and the Frenchmen that were there would take the door off the cabin to step dance on. <laughs> so play fiddle. So, yeah, he had a lot of stories. And he lived in Gorham, Maine, although he was from New Brunswick. He was a friend of both my grandfather and Uncle Lucian. Mm -hmm. He was at those parties. So and Gorham, Westbrook are just, you know, slightly inland from, from Portland. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we've, a, lot of, a lot of filling has gone on there. A lot of violin making, a lot of filling making has gone on yeah. there, too. There were some, yeah. Even before dawn, there were some, some good, well-known violin makers from Westbrook. And then one of Don's early professional gigs here. Oh, yeah. Tell us yeah. about that. Al Hawks. Al's a local, uh, old time uh, country. country bluegrass musician, and yeah. quite talented. And we were the, one of the, I was one of the Night Hawks. <laughs> <laughs> so, so. Yeah. And then main French fiddlers, we talked about mm -hmm. that a little bit. Yeah. Uh, Jerry Robichaud, my cousin Louis, Uncle Lucian, me, friend Jay Young, still plays with us. Erica Brown has a nice bluegrass career now. Uh, Stu McConnell and Cindy. Yeah. <laughs> we saw Jay Young in the picture of, of Al Hawks and the Nighthawks. And yeah. I guess Jay never had any hair, did he? No, <laughs> he, he did. came out. He just, used to. Uh, he came out and was going back the same way. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. And one other um, thing that's one of Don's big projects, Don and Cindy are very, very great about, big on boosting their tradition, and their heritage, making sure other people get the opportunity to learn some of these tunes and real big boosters of the music. They were incredible help to me when I was preparing this exhibit. Um, and Griff just you know, extended great trust to me and loaned me all these pictures and loaned me three fiddles to put on. So it, it, it was great, but they are you know, good boosters of their own tradition. And go to the last slide here. One of their um, <laughs> biggest things they do, quite literally biggest, is this fiddle orchestra called Fiddleicious. Fiddleicious started in uh, fall of 2000. I just wanted to give back to the community started teaching for free, uh, and I had a few ideas where it might go. There was a dozen people, so it soon went up to 30 or 40, and they wanted to do a concert series, and I didn't want to do it because I knew what was involved with putting a concert on, and four or five of them jumped up, and uh, so we, we did it, and we had a uh, raffle. Uh, one lady had a couple of tickets to Natalie McMaster's concert, put them up for a raffle, and 
came up with the name Fiddlicious, and, and now we're in our 13th year. Uh, and uh, there's 140 people on the roster, and there's usually 90 or so. Play we're bigger than the Portland Symphony now. Good. <laughs> but a lot of it's beginners, too, and we write simple parts for them so they can play along and the tunes get up to dance speed, and they just try to keep everybody involved all the way through it. So we teach from January till end of July. We refresh it from August till the end of October and have four concerts and a party, and we're done for the next year. So. That's good. That's good. And it's all free to the public and players. So. All right. All right. Well, I'm going to shut up here and I'm going to let Don and Cindy talk through their music from here on out. Uh, since we've gone on a little while longer than I intended, I won't take questions now, but I'm sure they'll be happy to talk with you at the break, maybe afterwards. And yeah, we'll take a 15 minute intermission. 15 minute intermission now. Okay, sure. <laughs> Whatever you come to, I call the story. All right. Thank you very much, folks. And please make welcome Don and Cindy. You are in for a treat.